Welcome to the second edition of The Forum, which is a panel discussion sponsored by the Original Church Community on Locals.com. The Original Church Community is my little community on Locals.com where people interact with me and we talk about um, matters related to early Christianity and what early Christian practice was like. And so that's why it's called The Original Church. And I am joined tonight for a very special conversation. I'm looking forward to this. I'm joined by actually two of my favorite authors. Um, wow. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that if I was going to pick up a, a book, these are two of my go-to authors. And Gosh, thank um, you. Yeah, yeah. So for sure. So so um, joining me tonight is uh, Mike Aquilina. And um, Mike has written at least two books on the subject of Mary, probably more. Um, he's very prolific. Uh, we've got uh, the two that I have in my hand here are History's Queen and Keeping Mary Close. And um, I was actually blessed to be asked to write the foreword for this book. I said no. For, no, I didn't. I actually did write. The <laughs> I wrote the foreword for this book. Um, just a couple of really beautiful books. Um, so uh, some of the, many of the things we'll be talking about, I'm sure, are covered in these books. And then we are also joined tonight by Shane Kapler, another great author, um, perhaps uh, one of one of uh, Catholic uh, the, the Catholic publishing world's best kept secrets. I think maybe not enough people know about Shane. So I'm going to make it my mission to make sure more people know about him. The uh, the one book I have uh, in my hand of his is The Biblical Roots of Marian Consecration, Devotion to the Immaculate Heart in Light of Scripture. Now that is a long and fancy sounding title, um, but this is a great book and it isn't just about Marian consecration per se, but it builds up to that, and uh, it's a it's a pretty comprehensive book as well. So, I really love all three of these books, and uh, highly highly recommend them. Um, I'm your host. I'm Jim Papandrea, and um, I have one book that's sort of on topic here. Uh, this is my book, "Praying a Christ Centered Rosary: um, Meditations on the Mysteries." And this book is is uh, not only about the rosary, but it's um, it's written based on the assumption that you know, pretty much everything we believe about Mary is actually also about Jesus. And uh, and and so, spoiler alert, you know, devotion to Mary does not, not only not take anything away from Jesus, but it points to Jesus. And so, uh, so we're going to be talking tonight about um, why do we need Mary? Um, before we get into it, though, I want to give our guests an opportunity to uh, maybe introduce themselves or say anything more about yourself that you'd like to. Mike, uh, anything you want to say to the audience tonight? No, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. I've I've uh, I've loved the work of of Shane and Jim for for many years now, and I use it in my own work. and uh, And I'm I'm just just tickled to be here. So thanks. I'm honored. Oh well, it's our pleasure to have you here. And uh, Shane, what about you? Anything you want to add? Oh. I just want to say it is a huge honor to be speaking with both of you. Um, I, uh, I'm just really excited to hear your thoughts on the Blessed Mother and the Lord Jesus tonight. All right. Well, um, it is it is a great topic, and um, I think you know we can we can begin by um, sort of acknowledging that when when let's say Protestants or other Christians, uh, when, you know, Christians may have a healthy respect for Mary as the mother of our Lord, um, but maybe not quite a devotion to her. And um, some Christians may worry about whether uh, devotion to Mary constitutes another mediator in a way that would violate the First Timothy passage. You know, First Timothy two five. There is only one mediator. And so, when uh, when our our brothers and sisters in Christ ask us the question, you know. Why do we need Mary? Um, I think it's a fair question, and I think it's worth answering. And um, so, so the the first way to get into that, I think, is to you know let's just tackle the the, the biblical question right away. Um, does devotion to Mary violate the principle of one mediator, 
uh, or in any way usurp Jesus's rightful place as our Savior. Um, who wants to jump in first? Can I jump in on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Jim, I, I love when people bring up 1 Timothy 2.5, because, I mean, when I was younger, that was a verse that I went to. I thought it it created problems for Marian devotion. But then I read it in context. And the way that Paul starts in verse 1 of that chapter, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all men this is good, and it's acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself up as a ransom for all. For this I was appointed a preacher and apostle. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands. So because Christ is our mediator, we can pray. We can pray in the one mediator, through, with, and in him. And so that's exactly what we believe the Blessed Mother is doing, all the saints and angels, all of us, whether in heaven or on earth, approach the Father through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, did you just read that from memory or did you have that in front of you? Come on, fess up. No, that's the beauty of doing a webinar. I can have it on the screen. <laughs> I thought you were going from memory there for a minute. I'm like, wow, that's impressive. No, I Mike, always wonder that. <laughs> when I watch, when I listen to Catholic Answers, I'm always wondering, does Tim Staples, does he just remember <laughs> all of that? <laughs> Some people can do know. it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Mike, what, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say the same thing, that that's talking about mediation, and mediation is something that happens frequently in the New Testament. We find people pleading on behalf on, the, on behalf of others, representing others, mediating for others before Jesus Christ, before God. St. Paul does it himself. And so, yes, Paul calls us to take part in the corporate worship of the church in 1 Timothy 2. You know, he's, 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 he's asking people, go to Mass offer these prayers, offer the sacrifice for this sake, be mediators for others in the one mediator who is Jesus Christ, because we live in Christ. That little phrase, in Christ, that St. Paul uses so often is just so rich in meaning. That little preposition, in Christ, we live in him. He lives in us, and we have such power as a result of that. He's sharing his life with us. We've become partakers of the divine nature, St. Peter says. Now, what yeah. does that mean? You know, what is this nature that we're sharing with God? What is this power? Well, part of it is the power of mediation. We stand and we plead on behalf of others because that's what our Lord asks us to do. And really, it's what, yeah. what Mary kind of exemplifies at the beginning of St. John's Gospel, right? When, when people go to her, she mediates their request. She goes to her son, right? It says, they have no wine. And Jesus yeah. says, a woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Yeah. And then she just turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> because she knows that her mediation will be infallible, that she yeah. will be heard and that he will honor his mother. So, yes, mediation takes place all through the New Testament, in the Gospels, in St. Paul's letters, in the Acts of the Apostles. And we're called to share this ministry of Jesus Christ because we're called to share all of his life. This is the wonderful thing about being a Christian. It's not just a ritual. It's not just a, an initiation into something. It's not just a badge I get to wear. It's divine power in my life. And part of that power is mediation. Yeah. You know, well, if I could, yeah, go, uh, go ahead, Shane. I was going to say, if we look back at 1 Timothy 2, 5, again, notice that Paul says that we're praying, we're interceding for people yeah. to be brought to the knowledge of God, our Savior. But then he says, for this, I was appointed a preacher and apostle. So Paul, I mean, Jesus is making use of him to bring people to himself. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, clearly, you know, he 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 mentions intercession in that context, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem is not with intercession per se, because if there's a problem with Mary's intercession, there'd be a problem with me praying for you, you know? Um, right. The problem is not, is not, uh, def it's not intercession per se. And I love, I love the way you both frame this because, um, you know, the fact that there is one mediator does not rule out 
other people's participation in that one mediator and in the mediation. You know, I, I often think um, it's it's very interesting that that uh, when Jesus is talking about sending the Holy Spirit, he says, I'm going to send another advocate, right? However you translate that word, but let's say advocate, another advocate. So so Jesus himself is the first advocate. Um, and then he says, I'm going to send another advocate, right? So so right there, there are two advocates. Um, and uh, and then, you know, don't we pray in the um, Salve Regina that Mary is also our advocate. So Mary is like the third advocate. Um, I love that. I love that. Okay. So, um, so then the question becomes, okay, if there's, if there's nothing wrong with Mary's intercession, if there's nothing about it that, that gets in the way of Jesus or usurps Jesus's primary role, uh, this, it still leaves the question, do we need it? Right. And, um, and I wonder sometimes if there isn't uh, as a product of the Protestant Reformation, perhaps a kind of built-in aversion to what uh, what some people consider the the extras of the faith. Um, we have these these uh, aspects of traditional Catholic uh, faith and practice that are perceived as being specifically Catholic, as though they were, you know, perhaps added later. That they're that they're extras. You know, you 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 get to the old uh, Calvinist analogy of the barnacles on the ship, right? And um, and and then so we get the sense that perhaps some of our our Protestant brothers and sisters are trying to create a kind of stripped down, minimalist version of Christianity. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Is that what's going on here? Is there a, is there an allergy to to the uh, to the to the robustness of these? Uh, of these devotional practices? I think so. I, I, I think you're right. I, I think there is a, a tendency uh, to desire something stripped down. And, and I believe that Luther and Calvin probably believed that such a church existed, you know, if they, if they could only find proof of it, right? Um, uh, but they probably believed that the, the truth is out there, you know, and it just, mm. it would just require a little bit of research. Um, uh, this is why the field of patristics arose, why people started studying early church history and the early church fathers with gusto. This is why Christian archaeology emerged as a science, as a discipline, because people wanted to know how did the early church live? And so they put the spade into the ground. And you know what? Every time the spade comes up, it comes up Catholic, right? Uh, and, you know, the more we learn yeah. about the documents of the early church, the more we dig into them, the more they look like you know, St. Joseph's Parish down the road here. Um, uh, yeah. They, they, I think that the, the problem with Luther and Calvin is that they imagined a church that is not borne out in the documents or any of the other um, relics, uh, the, any of the other monuments of early Christianity. What we find from the beginning is, you use the word robust, this rich, robust life of the church that involved Marian doctrine, uh, uh, devotion to the holy angels, devotion to the martyrs and the saints. All of these things are in the historical record, in the documentary record from the beginning. And once you start digging in the ground and you bring up those Christian churches and the catacombs and all of the other uh, remains of the early church, you see the same thing. You see images of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You see images of the angels. You see uh, you see uh, petitions to the saints and the angels uh, carved into the walls of um of of these of these shrines and these catacombs yeah, yeah. preserved for well, the ages it's you know it's definitely true that that myth has persisted and and you know as a kid growing up in a protestant denomination this is what i was taught in catechism classes that that the protestant reformation was uh all about getting back to some kind of original version of christianity before the catholics added things and that that idea was so ingrained in me that when I decided to do a PhD, I thought, well, I better study that original Christianity and see what that was like. And, you know, I, I'm not the first and I won't be the last, but you you get a PhD in patristics and you you have to make a decision. Yeah. Do I, you know, do I become Catholic and and, you know, immerse myself in what original Christianity really was? Or do I find a reason reason not to? And um, 
you know, uh, Shane, you're, you know, you, you do a lot with scripture and stuff. I, I'd love to hear your opinion on this because we know that, that, you know, the reformers like Martin Luther, especially, um, he, he didn't give up some of the extras. Like, in other words, he, he believed in Mary's sinlessness and perpetual virginity. How did he, and I'm not a Luther scholar, but like, how did he reconcile that with a doctrine of sola scriptura? Because, you know, let's face it, the, the New Testament doesn't quite spell out Mary's perpetual virginity, and, and yet he believed it. Any thoughts on that? Well, Jim, let me start with Mary's sinlessness, um, her immaculate conception, because Luther, and, and I'm not a Lutheran scholar either, but as I've I've tried to do my homework on what Luther believed. Boy, he said something incredible in his personal prayer book of 1522. He said that Mary is full of grace. So he starts from that scriptural text, what Gabriel says to her. She's kakeratomene. And he says that that means she's proclaimed to be entirely without sin. Grace fills her with everything good, makes her devoid of all evil. God is with her. And everything she does, it's the action of God in her. So Luther, he can take that scriptural text, hail full of grace, and in it, he sees that Catholic doctrine, which at the time, of course, had not been proclaimed by the church infallibly. The church was still meditating and trying to come to a point where she could say this um, in a clear way. And yet Luther, he's already able to make that claim from scripture, I think, too, that with the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother, that Luther and Calvin, the way that they read Scripture, they don't understand it to be making any claim that Mary gave birth to other children, which I'll hear a lot of my separated brothers and sisters. They just take it for granted that when it says the brothers and sisters of Jesus, that's a closed case, where Luther and Calvin, they had enough knowledge, I think going back to Jerome, how he was reading scripture, to say, no, that's not what the text is claiming. And yeah, yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, that that's how I, I looked at yeah. it. Well, no, that's that's a great point because um it, you know in a lot of ways the the scriptures really do support these doctrines. Yeah. Um and 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 you're absolutely right. I mean Luther knew enough Jerome to know how how Jerome read that and um and and you know actually I mean there's almost nobody in the early church I want to say there's nobody in the early church who thinks Mary had other children I mean uh it's it's virtually a unanimous consensus that the question is not whether Mary had other children but but which of the two options for explaining the brothers and sisters of the Lord are you going to go with yeah, most of, most of the church fathers, I think, actually go with the uh, step siblings answer, which is basically what you get in the Proto Evangelion of James. But Jerome, I think, is is one of the in the minority. He goes with uh, cousins, uh, if I remember right. So, um, so, but but yeah, the point being that nobody in the early church thought Mary had other children. Uh, her sinlessness and her perpetual virginity are just assumed across the board in uh in the church fathers am i right about that mike or am i uh, am i no. overstating that no 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 you're right and it's funny i had a dear friend his name was gene kale and gene gene was uh of lebanese extraction right and his his parents came from lebanon and his parents were his his father had married a woman and his father's brother married that woman's sister and so the two brothers and two sisters and all of their offspring lived in the same apartment in Pittsburgh, you know, in the uh, in, in, in the second half of the, uh, the 20th century. Uh, they, 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 they went back and forth between their original language uh, and, 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 the, and, and, and English. Right. And and Gene, to his dying day, referred to all of his cousins who lived with him and actually shared his bed, his, the brothers all slept together. He referred to his cousins as his brothers. And he said that that's just a typical Le Lebanese. It's a typical Semitic uh, 
thing to say. You you refer to your kin as your your brothers, your sisters. And so he didn't. He just thought this was a natural thing. The first time someone challenged him on this doctrine, this Catholic doctrine, he was like, "What are you talking about? Yeah. What planet yeah. are you from?" Right. Because right. you know, having grown up in a in a Semitic milieu like this, it you know, yeah, it just didn't make sense to him. That's right. That's right. And we forget that uh, sometimes reading the scriptures themselves can be a cross-cultural experience, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see someone has a hand up. And what I'm going to ask people to do is if you have a question, um, put it in the Q&A and then uh, we'll uh, we'll see it there and we'll we'll read it. Um, You know, on this subject of Mary being full of grace, as you know, I teach in a Methodist seminary and Methodists get uh, at least theoretically get their um, their theology from John Wesley. One of the things that Wesley talked about was the possibility of being entirely sanctified. And, uh, you know, we all sort of understand sanctification as a process. Um, and and the, the question was whether or not a person could be entirely sanctified in this life. Now, in the Catholic world, I suppose we might call someone like that a saint. Um, but uh, but I tell my students, you know, when you think about the angel's address to Mary, hail, full of grace, he's calling her that like it's a name, like it's a handle. And to me, that says that she was entirely sanctified, that she uh, that apart from her son, she was the only person who's ever really been entirely sanctified. Does that sound right to you guys? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the East, one of her titles since ancient times has been Panagia, all holy. Right. Yeah. And and when the angel says full of grace, well, what is the only thing that would impede grace? That's sin. Right. So to say that she is filled with grace means that she is sinless. Right. Because she's able to be filled to the brim with grace. There's nothing else in there to impede the presence of God's grace. So, yeah, that that title that, that, that you use from the Wesleyan tradition seems to be a reflection of the early church's devotion to Mary as Panagia. And it would not surprise me to, to learn that uh, that John Wesley knew that because he was a great Greek scholar and a scholar That's of right. the fathers. That's right. And he he himself also uh, believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary, if I remember right. So, yeah, yeah, that's uh, so that's, a I think, a good point of of connection. Um, so if but if the if the reformers seemed to have no problem with Mary's perpetual virginity and even her sinlessness. Um, what happened to, you know, to get from there to the modern world. In other words, it, clearly the the idea that that Mary had other children, the idea that that Mary and Joseph had a um, consummated marriage, uh, these are not required for reformation theology because the reformers didn't didn't need them. So what happened between then and now that it seems like everybody just assumes that, you know, obviously Mary must have uh, you know, had other children or whatever. Any thoughts on that? I have an opinion. <laughs> you know, and here we fall to psychologizing because that's all we can do, right? We can guess. And and you know, one of one of the very early uh, disciplines of Protestantism was uh, the abolition of celibacy. It was kind of an anti-discipline, right? Um, Luther himself had been a celibate, and and with the Reformation, with his Reformation, he ceased living a celibate life. He broke that vow. Uh, and he married a woman who had been celibate, and and uh, and she broke her vows, right? So this is um this is this is kind of the beginning of the Reformation. It's it's kind of built upon this act of throwing celibacy away. And I think there's a sense that if I can't do it, because we know that Luther was troubled by by the, by his experience of concupiscence in his young life, right? Um, so uh, there's a sense, I think, that if I can't do it, well, then nobody can. Mm-hmm. That's very right? Augustinian of him, too. <laughs> yeah, if I can't do it, then no one can. But, but yeah. you know, Augustine eventually came, you know, he said, uh, right. give me a chaste heart, but not yet. <laughs> right, right. Well, he eventually did it. He, yes. he spent a lot yes. of his life thinking that way, but he eventually did it. Uh, Shane, you got anything to add to that? Any thoughts? 
No, honestly, I was hoping Mike would take that one because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, well, I, I'm really just, I have not been sure how that happened historically. If it was simply a matter of losing touch with our roots, I mean, because plenty of Catholics do that. And so I've wondered if my Protestant brothers and sisters did too, with what Luther and Calvin actually believed in that regard. Yeah. I mean, here's my opinion. I, I think it's it's partly a product of the Enlightenment, of the rationalism of the Enlightenment, and then and then layer on top of that the sexual revolution. But I think, you know, an, a, a byproduct of all that is not just a kind of hyper rationalism that, um, you know, that that maybe poo poos the idea of celibacy. Um, but I think that I see sometimes an assumption in people that sin is a necessary and essential part of the human experience. Hmm. So I even sometimes will get students say that they believe Jesus sinned because if he didn't, he wasn't really human. And I have to, I have to stop and point out, well, wait a second, sin is not an essential part of human nature, right? Uh, hmm. Sin is actually a a falling short of our full human nature. And so in that sense, Jesus and Mary are the only ones who who fully realized human nature, right? Um, but uh, but I think there is, and, and you know, maybe partly sort of uh motivated by a desire to justify sin in in the individual, but I think there's a real there's a real assumption out there that that sin is such a natural and 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 um unavoidable part of human nature that you know somehow if Jesus and Mary didn't sin they weren't really human you know which is uh something i need to we we need to correct i think um so i forgot to ask you uh step siblings or cousins your 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 pick <laughs> i choose cousins i'm with jerome here <laughs> i am too yeah well uh that's we're 3 for 3 on that um and and one of the reasons why I feel like I have to go with cousins is because two of them that are mentioned, James and Joseph, mm -hmm. are mentioned also at the end of the gospel. And if assuming it's the same James and Joseph, it says their mother was there at the crucifixion. So if their mother is alive, they yeah. can't be Joseph's sons with someone who's passed away and he's now a widower. So if assuming those are the same James and Joseph, um, then their mother is still alive, uh, which which would, I don't know, maybe make her Joseph's sister. Um, probably not yeah. Mary's sister because you know Mary's a popular name, but yeah. I doubt anyone's going to name two sisters Mary and Mary. But <laughs> according to the earliest historians, um, uh, I think it was Hegesippus who said that uh, that that Alpheus was the the brother of Saint Joseph. Oh, and okay. Alpheus was also the the father of um of Saint James. Right. I'm you know, Mike, I, I was just <laughs> looking um to it a quote from Hegesippus in um his ecclesiastical history where he was talking about how James as well as Simon are both Jesus anepsion. So he uses that technical Greek Greek term for cousin. Mm. Hmm. Very, very interesting. Uh, you know, I, and, I've also always been fascinated by, you know, we hear a mention of Jude. And of course, in the New Testament, we have the epistles of James and Jude. Well, right. when Jude identifies himself at the beginning of the epistle, he says, Jude, a servant of Christ Jesus and brother of James. And so, whereas James is known as the brother of the Lord, Jude chooses to identify himself as the brother of James. So I've wondered if he may be a little bit more distantly related mm. than James, who would have been a first cousin. Yeah, very interesting. That's, uh, you know, that's definitely possible. I always wonder if if it's just out of humility that he is not saying I'm, I'm you know, blood related to Jesus, you know, by mm -hmm. cousins or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, it it does seem I mean, one of the one of the arguments for them not being his direct siblings is that if they were, someone would have written that down. Like in other words, that they would that there would be a claim there of, you know, 
having having been children of Mary as well. It's, yeah. There is no claim of that. Yeah. And, and another thing is that that our Lord from the cross would not have called the Apostle John to leapfrog over all of these other siblings in order to yeah. be mother to John. I yeah, think that absolutely. he was providing in a in a in a in a literal sense, he was providing uh, for her care by entrusting her to John. In a mystical sense, you know, he was giving her as mother to all of us beloved disciples. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is happening at the same time. But uh, but yeah, he would not have have had um ha have had John you know cut in line ahead of right. his his yeah. actual siblings, her actual children. I think of the scandal that that would have caused, too, in the Church of Jerusalem, because John and James are both there ministering yes. in that same church. Yes. So if you have James's mother living with John, mm -hmm. it yeah. doesn't yeah. add up. Yeah. No. no. I, yeah. Yeah. OK, so um, so with all that being said, then it seems like maybe uh, sometimes the you know, the question and the skepticism about uh, about Catholic devotion to Mary comes from a place of. Of, of perhaps an implicit assumption that that there's that there's a zero sum game going on here that somehow you know more devotion to Mary means less devotion to Jesus or takes away from Jesus and and do you think that's true and if so how do we overcome that mindset hmm. I you know in practical terms more devotion to my wife does not mean less devotion to Jesus. More right. devotion to my wife means that I thank the Lord that she was given to me in holy matrimony many, many years ago, and I've I've spent all these years with her. Um, more devotion to my mother does not distance me from Jesus, because my mother was a godly woman who drew me close to Jesus all the time that she was alive on this earth, and uh, and and I think that that that's true of any any devotion, any holy devotion uh, that's um that's in the church that. that that these things do not distract us. The gifts do not distract us from the giver, uh, you know, that unless we allow them to. Uh, we can make idols of anything, but we don't make idols of these people. You know, we, we, we live with all of them in the great church, the universal church, the cosmic church that includes, includes heaven and includes purgatory. We're all living together, church militant, church triumphant, right? Um, uh, and, uh, and and church suffering. We're all living together in the same church. We honor one another to different degrees. We give adoration only to Jesus, only to Jesus. There's no one like him, uh, only to God. So, so adoration is something that's proper only to God. We don't give that to anyone else. Yeah, in fact, uh, we're going to come back to that question of, of how, how do we know if we've gone too far with uh, with devotion to anybody other than Jesus? So we're definitely going to get back to that. Shane, you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, how do we overcome this this zero sum game mindset? Yeah, I mean, Mike, he hit the nail on the head when he's talking about the first thing is to recognize how the Lord has put all these other people in our life that he desires us to love and be loved by and experience him through them. The second part for me, the hurdle after that was, okay, but these are people on earth and the Blessed Mother and the saints are in heaven. So there seemed to be like this dividing line that I wasn't supposed to have any kind of contact with them because in my mind, it went back to the Old Testament prohibitions like Deuteronomy 18. You don't practice necromancy. You don't practice divination. So um, it seemed like I could only have spiritual contact with God himself, and I wasn't supposed to address any kind of prayer to anyone else. And what overcame that for me was the deeper that I went into scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, and really something um, meeting Catholics who were on fire with the Holy Spirit. Um, at the time, I was attending a non-denominational church, a very charismatic spirituality. But when I met Catholics who were involved in the charismatic renewal, and I could see these people are in love with the Lord Jesus, they are open to the Holy Spirit, and they're completely devoted to Mary, how does that work? And so asking it very plainly, how do you justify that? And speaking to someone who's dead, and what what a person said to me is, Shane, they're not dead. 
and they pointed out to me that Jesus has established a new order, that the Lord has opened heaven to the souls of the justified and brought his people around his father's throne. So just like Jesus said, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. They remain spiritually alive. They even increase in that life. And when I pray and I'm approaching the throne of grace, as Hebrews says, well, Hebrews goes on to say in chapter 12 that when you approach God in the heavenly Jerusalem, you are approaching myriad and myriad of angels in festal gathering, that you're approaching the souls of just men made perfect, and you are approaching Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So you can't draw close to God without simultaneously drawing close to all of the souls that surround his throne. And then when I looked at the book of Revelation and we get into chapter five, and you see these 24 elders representing the souls of the just made perfect, and they're before God, dressed in white robes, golden crowns, so they're that royal priesthood that St. Peter talks about, and in their hands are golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's holy ones on mm -hmm. earth, and they are offering these before the throne, and then angels are taking those prayers like incense and offering them on the altar. So, saints and angels in heaven, God has put them in this position of offering him my prayers. So who am I not to ask them to pray for me if scripture says this is the the role that God has appointed them to? And in that same scene, there are the, the martyrs, right? The martyrs who are yes. under the altar, and they're saying, how long, O oh Lord, how long? So they are keenly aware of what's mm -hmm. going on on earth. They're not saying how long about anything in heaven. They're happy where they are, but they're looking at the events on earth and they're interceding. They're praying yep. for the relief of the church on earth. So all of these things, it's, it's, it's like when, when that, when that uh, curtain was torn in the temple, it's like the sanctuary, the dividing between the sanctuary of heaven and earth was just thrown open. And all of a sudden, uh, we, we can see in these books what really happens at worship that we're standing yeah. there with all of these saints since Old Testament times, we're all praying together. I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Both of you, that, what you both said is just, that's that's so beautiful. And yeah, I mean, we have, to, we have to remember that the prohibition against necromancy is a prohibition against the occult. Yes. It's a prohibition yeah. against seeking power through essentially demonic forces. Mm -hmm. So uh, that means, you know, no seances, no tarot cards, right? <laughs> all right. that stuff. Um, but it's not uh, it's not at all to do with what we're talking about here. That was great. I, I, I love that. Um, OK, well, let's uh, let's switch gears just a little bit here. Uh, this will this will be fun, I think. Um, Shane, you go first. Uh, favorite title or titles for Mary? I've got to go with the new Eve. Um, because for me, this really captures everything. I mean, if Mary is the new Eve, the prophesied woman in Genesis, then um, all of these Marian doctrines can be folded into that title, because Eve, she's created in friendship with God. She's created without sin. And so to acknowledge Mary in this role, it it's acknowledging that about her. Um, it it ties me to the foot of the cross. It ties her to being the mother of not just Jesus, our head, but of each member of his body. Uh, so yeah, I'm incredibly fond of that. Uh, that's great. That's great. And that is one of, it's one of the earliest ones that, that comes up in the, in, in the church fathers too. I mean, it's, it's right there from the beginning. Beautiful. What about you, Mike? Uh, well, Jim, you and I have talked about this, and I know yours. Yours happened to be mine too. So oh, that's all right. You go. Gonna, you go, and I'll 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 chime in afterwards. But go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to steal all your thunder, but I that's I love right. I love the idea of Mary as new uh, ark ark of the covenant, ark of the new covenant, um, because uh, because we we see that in especially in the book of Revelation, where John suddenly you know sees the sanctuary of heaven and sees the ark of the covenant 
and it's a woman. <laughs> it's a woman in labor giving birth to the the male child who will save the world. Well, uh, it's Mary, right? Uh, yeah. She's the Ark of the New Covenant. Um, and 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 of course, once we get into the text of um, of of the the presentation or narrative. Or, uh, not the presentation narrative, but the visitation narrative in St. Luke's gospel, you know, it becomes clear that that St. Luke is 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 using a lot of the same language that's used in the Old Testament to describe uh, the procession with the Ark of the Covenant to its final resting place in Jerusalem, right? So so it's the same language being used. And and when yeah. when St. John the Baptist leaps in his his mother's womb, well, he's dancing the way David danced before the before the ark. This is very beautiful. And the fathers of the church picked up on this. St. John yeah. of Damascus used these images when he described the assumption of the Blessed Mother into heaven. So so that when she gets to heaven, what happens? David dances before her to welcome her. It's beautiful what the fathers saw in these passages. And we, we need to learn how to read that way, too. Re kind of a whole Bible reading of every text, because the whole Bible is the context for every text, for every passage yeah. in the Bible. Yeah. It, the Bible only has one author, and he's only yeah. telling one story, and it's the story of my salvation. He saved me, you know, so so he's trying to tell that story in this book. Lately, though, I, I've been really, really thinking a lot about her as as to, to use the title uh, in the um, in the litany of Loretto, she's queen assumed into heaven. And again, mm. this is something that the fathers often meditated on. It's it's very interesting um, that she's not the first biblical figure to to be assumed into heaven. It seems likely that Enoch in the book of Genesis was assumed into heaven. He was there and he was taken up and he was seen no more. Right. So so that's going on there. Uh, you know, according to ancient Jewish tradition, Moses was also assumed into heaven. And there's an allusion to that in the epistle of St. Jude in the New Testament, right? And of course, Elijah is assumed bodily into heaven in a fiery chariot, right? Yeah. So the, the cool thing about the fathers, especially the Syriac fathers, is that whenever they consider Mary, they consider her along with these Old Testament figures who were also assumed into heaven. So we have the hymns of Simon the Potter, uh, one of the Syriac fathers, where he's describing, uh, you know, Mary assumed into heaven, and he's also uh, kind of invoking uh, the um, her her kinship in this way to to Moses and Elijah. Uh, we see it in in um, in Saint Ephraim of Syria as well. You know that this is something that the fathers really meditated on in a profound way, and they did it in the context of the whole Bible. If we want to just look at the book of Revelation, we can see Mary's body in heaven, and it's a royal body. She's she's crowned as a queen, right, and with the stars, and she's got the, the moon at her feet, all of these beautiful images. That's Mary. There is no other mother of the male child who saved us all, right? Yeah. Um, so so that's that's um that's a really great thing. But but we look at that image and and that truth that assumption in the context of the whole Bible. That's what the fathers did. And so they had these rich meditations on Mary as, as queen assumed it to heaven. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. I, you know, I, I want to go back just a second to the, uh, the image of Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant. Uh, and you, you, uh, you mentioned Revelation, the book of Revelation, and the, the, uh, the woman with, crowned with stars. Um, and, and I think it, it needs to be pointed out in, and I'll admit, for a long time, I fell into the same trap that many, many people fall into, which is to think that at the chapter break between mm -hmm. chapter 11 yeah. and 12, that <laughs> somehow there's a new topic being brought up in chapter 12. Now, everybody needs to remember that the chapter and verse numbers were added way later. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't even remember, I want to say 17th or 18th century. I mean, like actually super recently in the grand scheme of things. And so take the chapter break out and you begin to see those last couple of verses of chapter 11. I saw the Ark of the Covenant. And then the first couple of verses of chapter 12, I saw a woman, the Ark of the Covenant. It's the same vision. But if you if you fixate on the chapter break, 
you're going to miss that and think it's a separate vision. And yes, the the woman is the Ark of the Covenant. Um, you know, the the correct me if I'm wrong, but the the same biblical language is used when the angel says that Mary is going to be overshadowed by the divine in order to conceive the Son of God. That same language is is used of the ark in the Old Testament, that, that the ark is overshadowed by the divine. Am I right? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, beautiful stuff. My uh, my other favorite is uh, Mary, the untire of knots. Mm. Um, that comes from Irenaeus. And, um, you know, I was really just, just thinking about this the other day. Um, th- you know, Jesus gives the authority to the apostles to bind and loose. And, uh, you know, this has to do with the, the authority that's, that's given to the apostles and then to their successors, to the church, to, uh, to forgive sin or not, right? To bind is to, to be bound to your sin. You're stuck with it. To loose is, to, is the sin is released. You're free of it, right? But that same language is used of Mary as the untire of knots. And it just just recently came into my head, this beautiful image of, you know, when when we feel bound to our sin and it feels like the knot is just too tight, but we want to be loose from it. Who unties that knot? Mary, through her intercession, um, facilitates our own forgiveness. And of course, it's it's Jesus who forgives. But but Mary facilitates that forgiveness through the, uh, the the untying of the knot. I don't know. I just that that, that same language is, is used in it. I, I thought it was great. I, I'm 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 your amen corner here. You know, uh, <laughs> that's absolutely true. And there's there's a way that this this is demonstrated in practical ways. Um, uh, actually, uh, in the experience of exorcism, you know, I've spoken to to a number of people who've who've participated in exorcisms, and they say that when they're performed even on people who are not Christian, because many people are troubled by the devil and they come to the Catholic Church for exorcism, right? Even right. in the movies, right? When they when right. they want to be delivered, they go to the Catholic priest, right? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so they, they go for that. And, and often at the moment of their de- deliverance, they say that they're, 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 um, they're, they find themselves in the presence of a beautiful woman a radiant woman, and this is the last thing they see before before deliverance. So I, I think that she wow. just has this this power uh, and this authority for the undoing of knots, even even the knots that are most tightly tied by the devil, right? Wow, yeah. There's a great T-shirt out there. It says, "Everybody makes fun of Catholics until you need an exorcism." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. So, so Mary is given all of these titles uh, throughout history that uh, you know usually have to do with with her role in bringing Jesus into the world, or or in intercession, uh, or something like that. Um, do you think we go too far when we start calling her co-redemptrix or co-redeemer with Christ? Um, or are there any titles that you think go too far? You know, I think that there are, um, I mean, properly understood, you know, we we talk about, well, St. Paul said that we are God's co-workers, okay? And what is the work? It's the work of redemption. So Jesus is drawing us into his redemptive mission and he is using us as his hands and feet, as his mouth to proclaim his word. Um, I, you know, it really strikes me that when we think about um, North and South America, I mean, the Lord Jesus allowed those continents to go without evangelization until his church carried his word to them. Um, so the Lord clearly wants to use the church in his redemptive work. And so the Blessed Mother is part of that. And I mean, has participated in it with a fullness that the rest of the church can only stand in awe of. So I think that that title is completely justified. But I do question sometimes whether it's helpful um, to, to use certain titles with our brothers and sisters that we know are going to push buttons and be so easily misunderstood. Because 
I just had to go through, you know, like a couple of paragraphs to explain why that is a justifiable <laughs> title. And so, you know, yeah. just to throw it out there, I can see it causing trouble. And I don't want to do that. I want to yeah. show people their mother and explain things to them. Um, so why uh, why put up a wall in their mind to begin with? That That's just my own take. I agree with Shane 100% uh, that, that I don't have a problem with the title itself because we're— <laughs> Mary's Mary's uh, call to be co-redeemer is my call to be co-redeemer. St. Paul heard the same call and he told the Colossians, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. That Amen. is the church, right? So there is co-redemption going on there because St. Paul is sharing in Christ's suffering. What's lacking? in Christ's sufferings. What's lacking in his sufferings? Only what he wills to be lacking so that his younger brothers, his younger sisters, will take it up and share his life, share his 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 work of redemption. So I, I, I think that we all do this. Mary does it to the ultimate degree, right? She shares in his redemption. That's why she's the one at the foot of the cross. Um, and um, and and so so we're all called to do it to some degree. This has been referred to the popes ever since St. Saint, Saint John Paul II, and the popes, one by one, have decided that it is inopportune to proclaim this title right now. And I, I think they're right. You know, yeah. the Reformation yeah. is still too fresh right now, and there will be misunderstanding. It will be, it will be, um, it will be misunderstood, and it will be an unnecessary uh, source of division. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, that's wise. I think you know. It, it it reminds me, well, you know, Shane, your your phrase properly understood. I mean, that's obviously the key to everything, but um, but it reminds me historically of the controversy over the title Mother of God, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Nestorius uh, couldn't, I don't know if he couldn't get his head around it, but I mean, like he 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 didn't like it because it was so mis so easily misunderstood, right? Um, She's not mother of the Trinity, right? Mm -hmm. But she is mother of the second person of the Trinity. And so uh, so ultimately, you know, there was a controversy. And as, as you know, um, it took an ecumenical council to declare the title theologically and Christologically correct. Yeah. And so we call Mary mother of God. Yeah. Um, and so perhaps we're on a similar trajectory with with some of these other titles that uh, that their day will come when we'll have to uh, clarify them. But, you know, it also makes me think of what Paul said about eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, it it may not be bad in and of itself, but if it causes, uh, you know, a brother or sister to stumble, it's worth not doing, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. Good stuff there. I mean, uh, it, it seems to me, if I remember right, that as early as Irenaeus in the, in the late second century, Irenaeus did call her, uh, not in so many words, but co-redeemer. And I think it has to do with her role in, in bringing Jesus into the world more than anything else, uh, that she is, that she is um, uh, you know, a, a kind of agent of, of redemption in that sense. What it I'm blanking on the term, uh, you know, Aquinas would would parse out different kinds of causality, right? Is there's the instrumental cause and the, help me out here, I'm forgetting that. Uh, I want to go back to Irenaeus, what you said about Irenaeus, um, because because uh, the phrase that, that you pointed out to me, Jim, uh, was cause of salvation, cause of salvation. Wow. You know, that's, yeah, right. That's, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, there's what uh, you you say instrumental cause, final cause, material cause. Um, th there are all kinds of causation, right? Right, and, right. And so, God causes things in a in a unique way that only He can cause them. But that's not what we're talking about here. You know, she is the yeah. handmaid of the Lord, and right. and what does a handmaid do? She gets things done for her master, right? Right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, she so so she's a uh, an indirect cause or a I, I guess it would be an instrumental cause, but not the direct cause. Um, but uh, 
But I think it's important to point out, um, and I and I I find myself constantly pointing this out with my students because uh, you know I teach in a context where I'm I'm always afraid someone's going to come up with the old um, the old argument that you know somehow God forced Himself on Mary, and so I always have to be very mm. careful to point out that that all of this was contingent on Mary's acceptance of it. Mary's fiat is is the moment uh, of of her decision, and of course because of her immaculate conception, um, she had absolute free will, but that's the point. She had the free will. And so by her, by her voluntary acceptance of her role in redemption, she becomes the instrument through whom, you know, the, the word became flesh. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's important to keep all that in mind, but, uh, but I'm with you. We don't have to move too fast on some of these things. And, and uh, you know it's interesting. I, I uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, over the years meet with people who are on the uh, Pontifical Council for the Promotion of Christian Unity, which I know has a new name now, but I can't remember what it is. But uh, it's you know the Pope's Council for Ecumenical Dialogue, and um, you know one of one of our colleagues on that council explained it to me this way that that you know when the Pope makes a decision or a pronouncement like this. The Pope functions not as the engine of the train, but as the caboose of the train. So if the church is a train, the yeah. Pope doesn't uh, doesn't make a decision and then drag the rest of the train along. The Pope is like the caboose, sort of announcing when the whole train has arrived in the station. And yeah. so the, the Pope will make a pronouncement like that when he feels that the church as a whole is ready for it. Um, and... Uh, and and that's that takes a certain kind of discernment. So I mean, you you mentioned the the Nestorian controversy before when he wanted to deny Mary the title Mother of God, saying that no one precedes God. Right, a mother must precede her child, and no one precedes God. Well, Saint Cyril of Jerusalem or Saint Cyril of Alexandria uh, really gathered all of the evidence and the contrary arguments and presented them there. Uh, but really, he was not. He is not. Um, it's not as if he and the Council of Ephesus invented this title, or right. or, uh, or or anything like that. His nickname, Cyril's nickname, is the Seal of the Fathers. So he's just he's just putting the seal of the fathers on on everything that they had said. You know, everything that had gone in those those centuries before. And that 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 term, Mother of God, in order for Nestorius to deny that, he had to deny the catechism lessons of 300 years and more, yeah. right? Because yeah. all of these children in his congregation had been taught the phrase Mother of God in their prayers and in their hymns by their parents and by their grandparents who had learned it from their grandparents. So even, yeah. even when they wanted to mock the Christians, when Julian the Apostate wanted to mock the Christians, he, he said, oh, you people, you, all you do is go around saying, Mother of God, Mother of God, Mother of God. And Julian, the pagan, you know, really foreshadowed Nestorius in the arguments against the idea of Mother of God, because he used the same, uh, the same logic in his arguments. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's an interesting point, and which kind of brings us um, to to my next thought, which is, um, you know, when it comes to praying to Mary, praying for her intercession, that that title for her, Mother of God, is actually in one of, if not the earliest uh, documented Mar prayer to Mary that we have, the subtum, uh, and and um, that comes from like the third century, mid third century. So you know the so not only these titles for Mary, but the the act of praying to Mary and asking for her intercession, um, well, it goes back all the way as early as we can see. We, we, can't, we can't point to a time in the church when Christians weren't doing that. Uh, we've talked about the concept of intercession a little bit. What else would you guys want to say to people that might make them feel more comfortable with the idea, if they're not comfortable with it, with the idea of Mary's intercession and Mary praying for us? Well, for me, um, the intercession of the saints, I mean, it always comes back to 
why does the Lord want us to intercede for each other? I mean, what is the point of that? <laughs> because, uh, well, even our prayers that we offer, we know that we don't change God's mind. You know, our prayers, if God is pouring out grace in response to our prayers, it's because from all of eternity, the Lord has woven our prayers into his will to bless the world. So, um, so the fact that Jesus puts a premium on if two or three of you agree upon anything here on earth, it will be done for you by my Father. The Lord Jesus is knitting together his community. He's building relationships between brothers and sisters by calling us to that joined intercession. And so what I discovered in my life was I remember 20 years ago, I was going through an incredibly hard time, and I asked the Blessed Mother and St. Therese of Lisieux to intercede for me. And it had been something I'd been praying about and struggling with for months. But as soon as I asked them to intercede for me, suddenly things completely changed. And I looked at that, and I the thought that came to me was, Lord, you are letting me get to know my mother and you're letting me get to know this dear sister and experience how much they love me. And these relationships that are starting now are going to continue for eternity. And so I think that that is why prayers to the Blessed Mother are um, so plentiful and so fruitful and efficacious in the life of the church, because Jesus wants to give us all these opportunities to come to know his mother. Um, and uh, yeah, so I that's why I, um, I I encourage people anytime I can to to ask the Blessed Mother's intercession. Yeah, Mike. You know, one one of the natural forces that creates the conditions for love in this world is mutual need. Mm -hmm. Mutual need uh, kind of provokes mutual care, right? Um, we're made to be interdependent. It says in the book of Genesis, it's not good for us to be alone. We need one another, right? And, 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 and what God wants from us, what's very clear, especially in the epistles of St. Paul, is that we need to begin with prayer for one another. We need to help each other. We need to feed each other. We need to, to pick each other up out of the gutter. But we need to begin by praying for one another so that we have God... We're loving in grace, you know, we're loving in a pure way. We're loving with God's love when we reach out in love to our neighbors. Um, I, I think this 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 need for uh, for intercession is just baked into us personally, but it's baked into all creation. You know, this is this is uh, this is kind of the, the thing that makes this is the the, the love that 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 uh, that made the, the the moon and the stars and everything. This is this is the love that turns the wheels of the cosmos. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. You know, um, I think the, the, one of the simplest answers to all of this is that you know prayer works, and God wants us to pray because that's how we participate, or one way that we participate in what God is doing. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of that passage in James and, you know, it's often translated something like, you know, the fervent prayers of a righteous person are, are very effective. And um, there's a problem with that translation, which is that the word fervent is not actually in the Greek anywhere. And, and when it's translated that way, it can easily take the put the emphasis on on that as if as if somehow the urgency of the prayer is what makes it effective but it's it's that it is the prayer of a righteous person that mm -hmm. makes it effective and mary being full of grace is apart from jesus himself the most righteous person who better to pray for us yeah. um but but then let's let's take it the next step and say what about the rosary i mean uh, let's face it, when you're praying the rosary, you're going to do a few Our Fathers, but most of it is is prayer to Mary. Is Any, any thoughts about how to 
help uh, maybe someone who's never prayed the rosary. And and to be fair, I mean, even when I came back to the Catholic Church, uh, at first I would always say to people, I'm I'm Catholic now, but I, I'm not going to be one of those rosary guys. Except now I am one of those rosary guys because that's just how it works. But uh, it took me a while, even after I was very comfortable with coming back to the Catholic Church, it took me a while to get comfortable with praying the rosary. Um, and so, you know, of course, I did what what I always do in situations like that. I wrote a book about it. But uh, what what are your thoughts about that? Help help someone like me, like the me 10 years ago, uh, become more comfortable with praying the rosary. You know, there's evidence that um, that that Mary inspired much of the book of John. The, the scholar Michael Pakalik wrote a book just recently on the Gospel of John, uh, where he makes the claim that that Mary is behind John's telling of every story. You know, John is living with Mary and she's reliving these moments that she witnessed herself. And John is is taking down her memories uh, it's also clear, at least to me, and it's it's been brought up by scholars as well, that uh, that St. Luke seems to have spoken with the Blessed Virgin uh, to uh, to inform, especially the infancy narratives. He, he drops those lines like Mary treasured these things in her heart and that sort of thing. He uses lines like that in a couple of instances, at least. And it seems that um, it seems that he's drawing from her testimony and even uh, the. Uh, the uh, television series now about the the Gospels, uh, the Chosen. The Chosen. Thank you. Uh, you know they they uh, they 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 riffed on that in one of their episodes that uh, that that Mary was uh, Mary was Luke's uh, source for his Gospel, especially you know in the infancy narratives. Um, I, I want her to help me to see the way she helped Luke, the way she helped John. Be with me. As I return to the scenes from our Lord's childhood, as I return to the scenes from the, our Lord's public ministry, as I return to the scenes from his passion and then his 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 glory in heaven at the end of the, the rosary, I want her to be with me, telling me, what did you see? You know, help me to see these 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 mysteries, these events as you saw them because you were there. Wow. Yeah, if I can add to that, um, when I'm praying the Hail Mary, as I'm meditating upon these events, I'm reciting the words of Scripture, the words of Gabriel to Mary, the words of Elizabeth to her, and the prayer reaches the crescendo in the name of Jesus. And so that is what my my voice is putting forth is Scripture, while in my mind and my heart, I'm meditating upon these events. And so my in my words, I'm asking Mary to pray for me as I'm meditating. And I'm shocked at how, by remaining faithful to the rosary over the years, the Lord, he constantly opens up these new insights into these same passages of scripture yeah. because it's God's word and it is so rich. And I was also struck once when meditating upon uh, the day of Pentecost, that third glorious mystery. And I, I was thinking about how, okay, to prepare the apostles for Pentecost, what did Jesus do? Sends them back to the upper room and they spend nine days in prayer with Mary. And what are they doing during that time? Well, we know from Peter, he's meditating upon the Psalms. He's seen the life of Jesus in scripture. And so from there, he knows we need to replace Judas, that empty office. And then on the day of Pentecost, he stands up and there's this explosion of scripture. Well, I'm sure that over those nine days, the Holy Spirit is bringing that to Peter's awareness, but he's there meditating upon the life of Christ in the pages of scripture with Mary. And that's what leads to Pentecost. And so it really struck me how, if I wanna open myself to the Holy Spirit, praying the rosary, this is the way to go about it. That's awesome. That yeah, that is that's beautiful. You know, I, it seems to me that there's there's just no question that all the apostles knew Mary, right? I mean, it would it seems to me that it would be foolish to think they didn't, and um and that she she was there. You know, we I don't know. May, maybe maybe some some of us have tended to forget 
just how much she's there. Um, and uh, yeah, she's there in the upper room. And it's it's necessary, I think, to be reminded of that. Uh, so to what extent would you say it's true that Mary is an apostle? You know, I've not used that term, Jim. Um, I uh, Neither have I. I just came up with it for this discussion. <laughs> um, but, it, but this is where my head went, you know? Yeah. You know, Jim, um, I, the way I think of it, apostle, I mean, it, you know better than me. The word means one who sent. And so um, when I think about the Blessed Mother in her earthly life, she didn't seem to be one who was sent out. She was one who True. stayed at the the center of the church, at the hearth. They they came home to her and were nourished. John, yeah. literally. Um, but after Mary's assumption into heaven, then I can see that term apostle. Uh, when I think of Jesus sending his mother to uh, to North America, and we see nine million indigenous people converted after this to her son. Um, so since her entrance into glory, she's been very much an apostle, one who sent on mission. But prior to that point, I, I haven't thought of applying it to her. That's a great answer. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it really is. Wow, I love that answer, Mike. You want to add anything to that, or? No, I, I mean, I think he, he he nailed it there. You know, he hit it out of the park. I, I, I can accept that, uh, you know, as, as a possible. She was definitely answer. a disciple. She was yeah, definitely yeah. a disciple. And there's, you know, yeah. the, the many of the saints point out that she is the first of the disciples. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I think, personally, I think she's the first Christian because she's the first one to say yes to Jesus and to invite him into her life, right? Yeah. I mean, so, okay, well, like, so here, here we're, you know, we're, 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 we're testing the boundaries here, co-redemptrix, apostle, and Mike, you had such a great quote in, I think it was in Keeping Mary Close, which by the way, I should mention, was co-written with Father Frederick Gruber as well, right, want to give him some credit for that, but, uh, so I don't know if this was something you wrote or something he wrote, but I wrote this down because I love this quote, the quote uh, goes like this, Superstition is the tribute credulity pays to true faith. <laughs> Superstition is the tribute credulity pays to true faith. In other words, you know, uh, if people take something too far and cross a line into superstition, at least that's a piece of evidence that there's truth in the thing to begin with. Maybe yeah. they take it too far, yeah. but, um, but there's something to it. So uh, let's let's talk about how we sort out the difference between uh, appropriate devotion to Mary and a, a kind of adoration that would go too far into becoming perhaps a form of idolatry, a form of worship, or, or how we would draw the line in in um, in actual practice, um, you know, between let's say mainstream traditional Catholic devotion to Mary and perhaps some of the things that happen in some of these syncretistic fringes, you know, where you've got, you know, uh, Santeria or voodoo or, you know, some of these things. How do we know where to draw the line? This is what the church is for. And this is what the tradition is for. We are accountable. You know, we're not, we don't make things up as we go along and we don't just kind of follow along to whatever people hang in front of us, right? Uh, we we hold ourselves accountable uh, to, to, to the generations that have gone before us. You know, when I was a little kid, baseball was my life, you know, from from June through October, you know, uh, because I'm out of school. Right. And from from June through August. And we just played baseball all day. And I want to I want I want my swing to be better. So how do I get my swing to be better? I watch my older brothers. I watch how they swing because they've been doing this longer than I've been. Right. And I and I and I get this this wonderful book. That's that's about hitting by Ted Williams and who who did hitting better than Ted Williams. Right. So I have the book. Right. And the book is going to tell me what to do. Right. And then I have the examples of my older my older my older brothers and how they swung the bat. Right. We have that in the church. You know, we have the scriptures right there which are in a class by themselves. We hold ourselves accountable to them. We hold ourselves accountable also to the, the early church fathers' interpretation of the scriptures. 
How did the fathers understand the scriptures? And then how did the saints put, put into practice what they gathered from scripture and tradition? So, you know, we don't want to go off and, and, and do something new. We want to, to look into, into the tradition of the church, see what the saints have done, and then follow after them. And then we'll be safe because we don't want to go anywhere near the occult. We don't want to go anywhere near voodoo and Santeria and all of those things that you mentioned, because we know that that's a doorway to demons. Yeah. yeah. I, Jim, I was thinking how some things that we do in our prayer, I mean, singing Marian hymns, um, you know, we may kneel as we're praying and ask, asking Mary's intercession for us. Um to some brothers and sisters, that'll seem strange, like we should only be doing those things directly to the Lord. But we're living in a time and day very separated from the early church and, and the Old Testament, because when we look there, we see that God's people have always composed hymns for the people that they admire in their service of the Lord. I mean, we think about the crowd singing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. Right. Yeah, and, right. and things like uh, kneeling down or prostrations, that was just a form of respect in the ancient world. I mean, uh, and also <laughs> it's the respect that you show to a parent, like when Queen Bathsheba enters Solomon's royal chamber. Uh, there he is on his throne, but he gets down and he prostrates himself in front of his mother. Yeah. So when we're doing those things as Catholics, we're really just being quite biblical in, in our devotion that we're showing to these beloved fellow disciples. And, you know, nowadays when marriage proposals uh, have become a social media event, right? Yeah. What do I see all the time in my social media feed but men going down, young men going down on a knee before they're intended, right? And proposing marriage, right? We this is yeah. this is what we do. This is what we've always done. It's it's what our body wants to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is it is and it it has a lot to do with intention too, of course. I mean, we sing hymns to Jesus, who is God, and we sing hymns to Mary, who is not. Um, but it's like I always say, you know, no one ever criticized the the ballad of Davy Crockett for worshiping Davy Crockett, right? <laughs> right. I mean, or building the so, Lincoln Memorial or the Jefferson right. Memorial, all of right. these things that we do to honor others. Right. And and you know, by the same token, you know, uh, no one thinks I'm worshiping you guys if I ask you to pray for me. And that is essentially what we're asking of Mary and the other saints is for their intercession not to ascribe divine powers to them or anything, but to ask for their prayers. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's that, that's good stuff. All right. Um, I, but I, I love, you know, the idea of um, avoiding, and, and it, it is a form of pride, avoiding the pride of thinking we can do things our own way, make up new things, pick and choose between this and that. And, you know, ultimately where people cross the line, I think, is when they treat devotional practices and the Christian faith in general like a salad bar, <laughs> where I can pick these things and leave these other things. And then I can go over to the other part of the salad bar that is Buddhism and pick these things and combine them, put them all on the same plate. And I can go over to this part of the salad bar and yeah, that's that's I think where you get into trouble and and um, yeah uh, you know so so now speaking of, of Mary in Scripture though and by the way um, I haven't seen any questions in the Q and A so uh, we can certainly keep talking here we're happy to do it but if folks have questions uh, feel free to uh, type them into the the Q and A box there all right um, what do you make of the fact that in in uh, John chapter two, at, in a little town called Cana, at a at a wedding, Jesus says, "It's not yet my time," and yet Mary says, "Oh, I think it is." <laughs> <laughs> what am I reading too much into that, or what do you what do you make of that? I make of it that it was his intention that she reset the time that he wanted us to see that. From all eternity, this was God's plan, that he wanted 
he wanted Mary to reestablish the time. There, there's no other way of understanding that because God knew from all eternity when his moment would be. If, if Jesus did not want that to be his moment, then it, it wouldn't have been his moment. But no, no, no. He wanted us to see her intercession and how effective it would be. Hmm. I like that. I like that. Shane, you want to add anything to that? Well, if if I could come at it from just a slightly different angle, um, it struck me how in John's gospel, Jesus, he'll frequently make comments that have a deeper meaning to it, something that it's pointing beyond the events of the moment to the Paschal mystery. So when I was looking at this verse um, between Jesus and Mary at Cana, I saw how literally just 15 verses later in John's gospel, after Jesus cleansed the temple, and the temple authorities want to know, what sign are you going to give us to prove that you have the authority to act this way? And Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. Now, within the context of, of him cleansing the temple, everybody naturally assumes he's talking about this temple that we're standing in. But of course, we know he's talking about the resurrection of his body, the definitive temple of God among men. And so when I've read the, the Cana account and Jesus says, oh woman, how is this concern of yours mine? My hour has not yet come. I've taken it as Jesus is directing our minds to his hour when that definitive wine is going to be given that, that Isaiah talks about, that great messianic banquet. And we see that wine flowing from Jesus when his heart is pierced and the blood and the water come out. And so the Lord is pointing ahead to that moment, but then he performs this sign of changing the water into wine to show his glory, to show the glory that will be revealed on the cross. And I've, um, I've kind of taken that too when at the end of the account, John says this, the first of his signs he performed in Cain of Galilee. So that miracle, it does point to the definitive giving of his wine, of his blood. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've read it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good stuff. I, uh, you know, personally, I want to see something Eucharistic in the 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 wedding banquet and and uh, the you know, the changing the water into wine, which of course you can't separate that from, you know, the heavenly wedding banquet and, mm -hmm. and, uh, the, uh, you know, the final, uh, Eucharistic meal, I guess the heavenly table. Um, and it just occurs to me that, that at the moment of incarnation, even the very moment when the word became flesh, when Jesus was conceived in the womb of Mary, that was kind of up to her timing too, because the angel came to her um, and it was up to her to say yes to it. So there she, she sets the time now and here she sets the time now. Um, my hour has not yet come, maybe is a reference to his passion. And maybe there's a little bit of, oh, you want me to do the wine thing now? I was gonna wait till, okay. I don't know, um, but I, I I just love the way we're seeing um, Mary at every point in the story of the incarnation and redemption um, being uh, not uh, not not a what's the word I'm I'm looking for? She she's not an extra character. She's not she's not just a walk on mm -hmm. character or a small bit part. She's a main character in the story. Yes. Um, Okay, so uh, Shane, you uh -huh. you talk in your book about um, your book is called the biblical roots of Marian consecration. What does it mean to be consecrated to Mary? Okay, well, that's that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> consecration, I mean, biblically, when something is consecrated, it's taken out of common usage and given over completely to the Lord, and so. Throughout scripture, we hear of altars being consecrated, sacrificial gifts, priests are consecrated. Um, so when we talk about being consecrated to the Blessed Mother, we have to upfront say we're using this word analogously. It's an accommodated sense because ultimately 
you can only be consecrated to God. So when we talk about Marian consecration, St. John Paul II, he would use the word entrustment as a synonym for consecration, that we are completely entrusting ourselves to Mary's love, to her intercession for us, that in response to that, Christ is going to be formed in our souls, going to be born in our words and actions and our prayer. So this idea of consecration, if we want to think about, well, where does this come from biblically? What, what can we point to in scripture, someone being entrusted to Mary so that they can more fully be consecrated to Jesus? Well, okay, first of all, I would say that God himself gives us this idea because who could be more entrusted to Mary than Jesus was by God the Father? I mean, so that's that's the highest compliment that a, a creature can be paid. But then Jesus passes this gift along at the cross that we've already made reference to. When looking down from the cross at Mary, he says, behold your son, indicating the beloved disciple. And then to the disciple, behold your mother. And it says from that moment, the disciple took her into his idia. And in English, we translate that as into his home. That's fine. It can be used as an idiom, but it literally means he took her into his own. That's the literal Greek. He is taking Mary into what is most personal to him. So yes, his home, but his interior life into his apostleship, his prayer. And Mike, as you were saying, that the Blessed Mother, when we read the Gospel of John, we're seeing the fruit of John having lived, prayed at least three times a day, every day with the Blessed Mother, celebrate the Eucharist with her, talk about Jesus' life, read scripture together. And so John, when we read his gospel, he has this incredibly unique vision among all the gospel writers of the person of Jesus. The, the quantity of material, you know, it he he narrates much less than what the synoptic gospels do but it's the quality the depth that he goes into in these in these signs that he does narrate it's like nowhere else and so we're seeing the effects of john being entrusted to mary and what what he's done by entering into her life in that way is he's started to enter into her consecration to Jesus. He is participating in it. And so John's discipleship and her discipleship are becoming merged. And that's what we're asking the Holy Spirit to do when we talk about Marian consecration. Um, Jesus at the Last Supper, he, he prays, Father, I consecrate myself that they might be consecrated to you, consecrated in truth to you. And so St. Paul, when he talks about consecration, he says, you've been washed, you've been consecrated, you've been justified. So consecration is, it's something that starts at baptism, but then it progresses as we live the Christian life. And so we can grow in this consecration by being united with Mary until that final consecration of death when we fully enter into the Lord's presence. Oh, that's that's good stuff. That's great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, do you want to add anything to that? There's very little I can add, but uh, you know, the the Second Vatican Council said that the vocation of the laity is to consecrate the world itself to God. That's the province of the laity. That's that's our bailiwick. This little corner of the world, my desk, my bookshelves, you know, this little place where I work. This is my sanctuary. My keyboard is my altar where I make an offering to God. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I learned to consecrate the world in this way from the sisters who taught me when I was very young. And they taught me the morning offering that I still use to begin every day. Oh, Jesus, through the immaculate heart of Mary, I offer you all my prayers, works, joys, and sufferings of this day. You know, you know uh, and, and it goes on from there. But, but you know, th this is, this is what, what we do. We offer these things through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and and they are even though I am, I am the worst of sinners, you know, and I I I find the need to go to confession every week, right? And uh, and 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 this is this is reflected in my work. It's re reflected in my relationships, 
But when I offer those to Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, they're purified on the way <laughs> because that heart is immaculate and it is making good what, what I've messed up. You know, she she kind of smooths over the edges and, and sends them on to God. And this is how the world is consecrated um, by me. I mean, that's the kind of of, um, of 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 authority God has given me as a lay member of Christ's faithful people, as someone who lives in union with Jesus Christ. Jim, could I add one thing? Yeah, um, please do. You know, um, we find that language of consecration and helping one another be consecrated in Paul's letter to the Corinthians first letter, where he talks about if there is a Christian married to an unbeliever, and he says that an unbelieving husband is consecrated through his wife, and an unbelieving wife consecrated through her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they're holy. And then he goes on to ask, wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband? Husband, how do you know whether you'll save your wife? So he's encouraging them to stay in these marriages. And Paul, of course, knows that Christ is the only one who saves. But these believing husbands yeah. and wives can be instruments of salvation in Christ's hands for unbelieving partners, bringing them to baptism. And then we know what Paul says in Ephesians 5 about when you've got two Christians that are married to each other, the, the purpose of that is for each of them to become holy and blameless, blameless to, to reach that perfection that Jesus desires for his bride. And they help one another to that. They share everything in their life together. There's nothing they hold back. That's complete entrustment, complete consecration yeah. for the purpose of being consecrated more fully to the Lord. Yeah, that's that's great. That's beautiful. I keep touching my ear because uh, apparently my ears are two different sizes. So this, <laughs> this wants to fall out. Um, but uh, no, I, I love oh, that. That's beautiful stuff. I love one of, one of maybe the most beautiful moments in all of scripture to me is, you know, when Jesus from the cross entrusts his mother to John and John to his mother and John there sort of standing in for us as the church, you know, behold your mother. And so, um, right. Yeah. If, 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 if John can be consecrated to Mary in that moment, so can we. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to point out for folks uh, for whom this concept might be new, um, I love the word entrustment because that's a good way to clarify that it's not the same thing as the kind of submission that we owe to God alone. Um, uh, we, we don't, we're, we're not submitting to Mary in the way that we would submit to God. We're not, we're not uh, doing the will of Mary in the way we try to do the will of God, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but we are entrusted to Mary as a way of participating in Christ. I love that. That's great stuff. Um, so we're going to start to wind down here a little bit, um, but I've got a couple bonus round questions, which, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. But I want to give you guys uh, an opportunity to uh, bring up any other topics or, or you know, say something that's been on your mind. Uh, Mike, you want to want to go ahead? And, do you have anything you want to uh, want to put out there at this point? I'm just having a good time listening to you two. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been great. Yeah. Um, but uh, all right. Shane, what about you? Yeah, Jim, just when you were speaking before, I was I was thinking, gosh, I always forget to say this. When we look at John's gospel and that scene of entrustment, immediately after that, John says, after this, knowing that all had now been completed, Jesus said, I thirst. And to fill, fulfill scripture, he receives that wine. And then you know, he says, it is finished. And he surrenders his spirit. So that scene, that entrustment of John to Mary and vice versa, that is part of the salvation that Jesus is bringing about. That has a role to play in the life of his church, because only after he does that is all of his work on the cross completed. And I, I think that's that's really important, and it gets overlooked a lot that he makes that comment. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. 
Sure. All right. This is this is great stuff. Great stuff. And again, if anybody has any questions, now is the time to put them in the Q&A. I hope the Q&A is working because I haven't really seen anything pop up. But um, if uh, if you have any questions, now is the time. So here's all right. So bonus round. Uh, I, as I understand it, this this the answer to this question may be more of a matter of opinion and may be open to multiple answers that still fall within the teaching of the church. But uh, but what do you think? Did Mary feel the pain of childbirth when she gave birth to Jesus? I'll tell you what the sisters taught me when I was growing up and that the vision in the book of Revelation is not uh, a vision backward. It's not a vision of of our Lord's birth from Mary, but um, it's it's a vision of the birth of his mystical body from Mary. You know, it says it's it refers to to her other offspring in that same yep. chapter of the book of Revelation. And we are those other offspring. We're the beloved disciples to whom he said, behold, your mother, <laughs> you know, he gave us to her that way. Um, so this is the pain that that she feels in 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 birthing the church and giving birth to the mystical body of Christ in history, that that there is a measure of sorrow in that. Uh, it's a it's a great mystery that even though we know Mary is in heaven and even though we know that she's she's the queen of heaven because of the vision of her in the book of Revelation, that she still suffers in giving birth to the church. This is something that that uh, that that comes up uh, comes up in, in in apparitions. It's a very mysterious thing, but she does suffer those uh, mystical labor pains as she gives birth to the church in time. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Shane, go ahead. Jim, this was something that really hadn't come to my attention until about 10 years ago. I mean, all the reading that I'd done about the Blessed Mother, no one had really brought this up. Mm -hmm. And then I started to, it was brought to my attention that in the fathers of the church, that really seems to be the common opinion that, that no, not only was Jesus virginally conceived, but that his birth had a miraculous element to it that just as our Lord's body passed through the walls of the tomb, yeah. so he miraculously entered the world through the body of his mother. Um, again, at one point in church history, this was common knowledge, but somehow in my catechesis, that got lost. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, the the, the issue is, of course, that in Genesis, uh, the the punishment of the fall, one one of the punishments of the fall is, the pain of childbirth, and so the implication of that is that that uh, you know many people throughout the history of the church have speculated that that therefore Mary would not have felt the pain of childbirth because she was born without original sin, um, she was immaculately conceived, she was without sin, and um, and you know to your point, I mean we 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 get some of these stories from the early church about uh, Jesus Jesus comes into the world um, and the church fathers relate that to his ability to pass through the locked door after his resurrection. Um, there's one or two of the uh, apocryphal narratives where, um, in fact, Mary doesn't actually give birth to Jesus. She just sort of looks over uh, at one moment and there he is. And all of a sudden she's not pregnant anymore, you know? So, mm -hmm. so some of them go, go kind of far, but, um, but then, you know, what we have in, in Genesis is you know this this idea but then in revelation it does mention the pain of childbirth but to your point mike um everywhere else where the pain of childbirth is mentioned like in the gospels and stuff it's always the it, it's it's not literal pain of childbirth it's the it's the 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 groanings of creation itself as it waits for redemption mm -hmm. and so um so I, I like the way you explain it that that she gives birth to the church i mean Certainly, she felt pain when at Jesus's passion, and that would that could definitely uh, be what Revelation is relating to. We, we do have a a question in the chat here. Why do you think God has used Mary so often to speak to Christians through apparitions and not other saints? Uh, any thoughts about that? Good question. All I can say is that after listening to you guys and the things that you've said, 
I, I can't imagine uh, anyone more beautiful to send, anyone more fitting to send than than the mother of our Lord. Uh, you know, she's just such a beautiful figure, and that that really comes through. I've been I've been deeply moved through all this time we've been talking. Mike, I I think the same thing. Um, that it's because she's the mother of the church, and uh, the Lord knows we need mothering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's nice. I mean. Uh, obviously, the the Lord has sent angels as messengers in the past. Um, I find it interesting that many of the apparitions in the modern world have been to children. Um, and I don't know if it's just a practical matter that a, you know, if Padre Pio showed up, the kids would be scared. I don't know. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, but I don't know. I mean, you know, don't send Jerome. Yeah, don't send Jerome. Yeah, don't send Tertullian. He's not even a saint. Um, yeah. So, so why, why Mary? Um, I, I really do think this. This may sound like not super spiritual, but I really do think that uh, she's such a non-threatening figure, and. Mm. And again, you know, at the risk of of sounding like, you know, not not super spiritual here, um, I, I know in my life in the past, there have been times when I have felt so, um, you know, at a low point that I felt either unworthy to talk to any one of the three persons of the Trinity or too ashamed to talk to any one of the three persons of the Trinity that uh, that I could go to Mary. and. I mean, you know how it is when you're a kid and, you know, I mean, it's good cop, bad cop. And mom's mom, I mean, in, in my home, mom was a good cop. So <laughs> um, actually, I, I actually had two good cops. But anyway, um, <laughs> but but you get what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. there is an approachability to Mary. Um, and uh, I think I think that the the very concept that Mary should appear to people uh, is a great mercy. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I guess I haven't done any research on, you know, whether there have been many apparitions of other saints at all, uh, but uh, I'm sure there have been some. Yeah, uh, it's a good Jose, question. St. Jose Maria had a great, um, a great uh, image he used. He said that, uh, that when a child goes outside and plays in the mud and gets himself all dirty, comes in through the kitchen door because he knows that mom will clean him up so that he'll be be able to sit down at the dinner table. And that's really what Mary does in order to to get us ready to sit down at the, the banquet of the lamb. Absolutely. I mean, that is so true. I mean, the, like I was saying, you know, there have been times in my life when I did not feel like I could approach God. And I went to Mary and I did not, you know, start worshiping Mary. Mm-hmm. I went to Mary and she got me ready to approach God again, yeah. you know? Um, so that's, yeah, that's so true. Um, well, here's another question. I, it's not on the question sheet, so I'm, I, it, it's a little bit of a surprise, but I, I think I know the answer to it, but I have heard, I have heard different answers and I've heard disagreement. Uh, as as we know, we one of our doctrines about Mary is her assumption that we, that she was assumed into heaven, uh, body and soul. And uh, we've talked about the fact that there have been other, uh, at least a couple other uh, Old Testament characters who were also assumed into heaven, but with with uh, I want to say Elijah for sure, maybe Enoch. It doesn't seem like they died first; they just went right to heaven without dying first. Now, Moses died first. So the question becomes, did Mary die first and then get assumed into heaven? Or did she get assumed into heaven without dying? I, I mean, theologically, I know the answer, but I, have you guys heard debate on this or or question marks over this issue? Well, I think that, I mean, most of the stories in the early church were about Mary's falling asleep, her dormition, and then her assumption. And so yeah, it, right. it seemed to me in the research that I'd done that that was the more popular opinion. But 
as you said, Jim, I mean, theologically, the church has never made any kind of declaration on the issue. I've heard some people say that they think it very fitting that because Jesus experienced death, that his blessed mother would also experience yeah. death before entering into that full life of the resurrection. Yeah. Mike, you want to weigh in on that? <laughs> I'm remembering uh, a discussion of this in, 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 um, in, in the, uh, uh, the document with which uh, Pius XII um, promulgated the dogma of the Assumption and declared the feast of the Assumption. Uh, he avoids using, uh, using any language that would settle the question in one place, although in another place, yeah. he seems to he seems to indicate that she did she did die, yeah. you know, I, I mean, there are two different passages in the same document, and it's been yeah. a while since I since I've read the document. Um, so um, I, I think it, it, you know, it seems to me it would be fitting, you know, yeah. For, yeah. for her to share in the lot of her son in that way uh, and in the lot of all of us. Um, but but I don't know. Well, I, I I just remember hearing uh, some folks who felt um, very passionately that uh, they did not want to believe that she had died and that they did not think that that the, the document that you're talking about uh, said that. Although, as I read the document, I think it does pretty strongly imply that she died without actually hitting you over the head with it. And as you guys know, you know, the the early church uh, Dormition documents that describe the story of her death, um, although they're embellished with a lot of legendary material, they were written precisely, I think, to sort of squash the myth that she didn't die mm -hmm. and to tell the story of her death. And, um, you know, in the, uh, in the early sources, there, there actually was a tomb of Mary in mm -hmm. Jerusalem. Now, she never inhabited it. I mean, you know, they, but she died, they set aside a tomb. Um, and then, and then according to the stories, three days after her death, her body is assumed into heaven. So the tomb never got used. Uh, so uh, obviously there were no relics of Mary, but, um, but that she did actually die before being assumed. Um, but, uh, but as I said, I've, I've heard faithful Catholics passionately um, disagree on that question. Um, another question in the chat here: the, Is the sub tu is the sub tuum a, a Marian mm -hmm. intercessory prayer? The sub tuum sub tuum presidium. It's now too late for me to speak Latin officially. Okay, um, is the sub tuum prayer currently used in any liturgy? Um, and I'll just say up front: I don't know, but uh, but I believe that the uh, is it the memoriae that is sort of based on the sub tomb? Um, but, uh, you know, certain lines in there seem to come from that. Okay. You guys, do you guys know if, uh, if there's any liturgy that uses it specifically? Not in the West that I know of. There may be a Coptic yeah. liturgy that, that uses it. Uh, the oldest instances, the oldest instance we have of it is in, is in a cache of, of, um, of Coptic documents and their liturgical right. documents. So it seems that in the early years uh, of the church that this prayer was was used in a liturgical setting. But that's that's really all I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's also worth saying that, you know, uh, in that prayer, um, there is the mention of of Mary through her intercession, it's implied, but uh, protecting or preserving the person praying from danger. And, uh, you know, it's worth pointing out that the prayer comes from a time of great persecution in the church. So it, this is, you know, in many ways, a kind of a foxhole prayer. It's a prayer yes. uh, coming from a place of of real anxiety and and um, well, danger, as the prayer says. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so anything else you guys want to add before we wind down here? No, this has been fantastic, but I, I can't think of anything else to add, guys. Right. You know, Jim, I'm just looking online here, and it says that it has appeared in liturgical settings, uh, not in the Latin rite, but in other rites, in Armenian and in Coptic, uh, in 
and so on. I mean, I, I'm just finding online there's a lot of a lot written about the the history of the subtuum. Yeah, yeah. You know what I do sometimes when I'm praying the rosary. You know, depending on your rosary, every once in a while you get you've got an extra bead in there that doesn't have a purpose. That's what I do on that bead as I do uh -huh. the subtuum. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, well, um, last chance for any questions, but uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, giving up your evening. This has been a great conversation. Um, thank I do you. Plan on, I, I do plan on posting this on uh, YouTube, but um, let me remind folks, uh, Shane's book, The Biblical Roots of Marian Consecration. You want to get that? Uh, Mike's books, uh, History's Queen, excellent book. Um, and then with uh, with Father Gruber, Keeping Mary Close. And then my book on the rosary, Praying a Christ-Centered Rosary. Um, if, uh, if you happen to stumble upon this discussion on YouTube and you want to engage more with these kinds of conversations, especially regarding the early church, uh, come and find us at uh, the original church community on locals.com. And that's where I am. Um, I'm not on social media, but but I'm on locals and that's where folks interact with me. And, uh, you know, I offer some uh, some content there. And obviously, uh, check out these guys. You're both on social media, right? I am. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so so you can find uh, you can find Mike and Shane. And I hope that you will uh, support them as well. And I think we're going to wind this down. But um I just want to thank everybody who participated uh, and uh, everyone who hung out with us live. And like I said, this will be, you know, posted on YouTube as soon as I can. So uh, thank you for joining me and uh, Mother Mary, pray for us. Amen. Amen. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Okay. Hey, thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. I really appreciate that. Please share this video with your friends and please join me in the Original Church Community on Locals.com. Don't forget that if you join the Original Church Community on Locals.com, you can join me each week for a live, in-depth, chronological Bible study. It's live streamed every Saturday, but you can watch it later if you're not available. So join me for that and I'll see you there. I hope to see you there. I hope to see you there and I'll see you there.